Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of H.R. 1540, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012, which overwhelmingly passed the Committee of Ar on Armed Services on a vote of 60 to 1. In keeping with the committee's tradition of bipartisanship, Ranking Member Smith and I worked collaboratively to produce the bill and solicited input from each of our members. The legislation will advance our national security aims, provide the proper care and logistical support for our fighting forces, and help us meet the defense challenges of the 21st century. The bill authorizes $553 billion for the Department of Defense base budget consistent with the President's budget request and the allocation provided by the House Budget Committee. It also authorizes $18 billion for the development of energy's defense programs and $118.9 billion for overseas contingency operations. The legislation we will consider today also makes good on my promise when I was selected to lead the Armed Services Committee that this committee would scrutinize the Department of Defense's budget and identify inefficiencies to invest those savings into, hi into higher national security priorities. We examined every aspect of the defense enterprise, not as a target for arbitrary funding reductions as the current administration has proposed, but to find ways that we can accomplish the mission of providing for the common defense more effectively. The National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012 achieves these goals by working to ensure our troops deployed in Afghanistan, Iraq, and around the world have the equipment, resources, authorities, training, and time they need to successfully complete their missions and return home safely. Provide our warfighters and their families with the resources and support they need, deserve, and have earned. Invest in the capabilities and force structure needed to protect the United States from current and future threats. Mandate physical responsibility, transparency, and accountability within the Department of Defense, and incentivize competition for every taxpayer dollar associated with funding Department of Defense requirements. Mr. Chairman, I know there have been many questions raised by the ACLU and others relating to a privilege to a provision in our bill dealing with the 2001 authorization for use of military force. I'd like to address some of those concerns now. Section 103.4 of the NDAA can, affirms that the President is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against nations, organizations, and persons who are part of or are substantially supporting Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. It also explicitly affirms the President's authority to detain certain belligerents who qualify under this standard I just described, which Congress has never explicitly stated. It's important to note that the U.S. Supreme Court has accepted the President's authority to detain belligerents as within the powers granted by the AUMF. Moreover, the language in Section 1034 is very similar to the Obama Administration's interpretation of the authorities provided pursuant to the AUMF. In particular, a March 13, 2009 filing in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. While U.S. courts have accepted the administration's interpretation of the AM AUMF, it is under constant attack in litigation relating to petitions filed by Guantanamo detainees. Because of these ongoing challenges, the administration's interpretation may receive less favorable tr treatment over time if Congress refuses to affirm it. Section 103.4 is not intended to alter the President's existing authority pursuant to the AUMF in any way. It's intended only to reinforce it. I believe that our men and women in uniform deserve to be on solid legal footing as they risk their lives in defense of the United States. Finally, some have suggested Section 1034 was included in the dark of night. I note that this language was originally included in the Detainee Security Act of 2011, introduced on March 9th, and was discussed during a committee hearing on March 17th. We've sought input from the administration, as well as Ranking Member Smith, his staff, and numerous outside experts. Moreover, the process used to craft this legislation is historic in its transparency. 
In fact, a copy of my mark was distributed to committee members' offices five days before our markup. The legislation, including the funding tables, was posted online nearly 48 hours in advance of our markup. It's also noteworthy that there are no earmarks in the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012. Every member request to fund a defense capability was voted on and includes language requiring merit-based or competitive selection procedures. To those who are concerned that members may unduly influence the D Department of Defense to direct funds to a particular entity, I can only recall the words of my good friend, the former chairman of the Armed Services Committee, Ike Skelton, who would say, read the amendment. What does it say? If DOD chooses to violate the law and the text of a provision in the NDAA requiring merit-based selection, the Armed Services Committee will take them to task. Finally, I thank the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Rules Committee for working with us to bring this measure to the floor. I urge all of my colleagues to support passage of this bill. In partnership with you, we look forward to passing the 50th consecutive National Defense Authorization Act, and I reserve the balance of my time.